being here. Yesterday, we had the grounding in the work that is happening and the work that may be possible. And now today, uh, this plenary, we are going to be talking about what, how do we have to be and what do we have to do in order to move this work forward to the next level, right? Because we didn't come here to stay the same. We know that our world and our communities are calling for us to be and do differently. And so this panel that we have coming up is going to uh, talk a little bit about that, about what do we have to do um, in order to make this new economy real for all of our folks. Um, so they will be coming up here, and I want to introduce this amazing, um, your amazing moderator, Makani Themba. Makani is the chief strategist of Higher Ground Change Strategies based in Detroit, and previously um, she served as a co-founder and executive director of the Praxis Project, which helped communities use media and policy to advance um, um, health justice. And so please welcome up Makani and your closing plenary. We are here together. Let's do this. Hey, what's up, beautiful people? Y'all here? We here together? You ready to go in? In, like in, in? You sure? All right, somebody said, one person said yes. Can we get some extra yeses up in this mug? All right then. Um, as folks are sitting down, I, I just, um, I want to take a minute for us to acknowledge where we are, so. One, it's been a very awesome weekend, has it not? Yeah. Yes, indeed, yes, indeed, yes, indeed. So um, I want to um, <laughs> I want to start with a couple of thoughts as I get ready to introduce folks. So here we are about to go in on this new economy, right? New. And when, so first I want you to think about, like, be grounded for a minute and what it means for something to be new, right? It's sort of like, some of it is about what histories and what knowledge and what stories are hidden for you to think it's new. Just sit with that for a minute, right? And then let's think about what is an economy? An economy is really just about relationships. It's about how we organize relationships. It's more than making and producing. It's about how we relate to each other, right? And, and a new economy is about changing those rules, right? But then we're also, new is also in relationship to old. And so here we are right here. And what does that mean, right? In a, be in a place called Buffalo, driving by the names of the original residents as street names, as street signs. To be standing, literally, in an old economy that we're living, right? And then, and then also, like, what does it mean when we think about changing and shifting that, right? An old economy, which is the current economy, that was built on the blood and bones and backs of people. Some of them ancestors, actually all of them ancestors to everybody here, if we're honest. Right, so what does, so we wanna be in that moment for a second and think about what does it mean to transform an economy? You think about this US economy. According to Harper's Magazine, about 22 million hours of labor was stolen from African people between 1619 and 1865. Now, they calculate that to equal $100 trillion. Now, that's a lot of money. In fact, it's so much money that it's more money than the entire U.S. Treasury has ever had in its treasury from the history of the United States. So sit with that for a minute. 
That's just black labor. That's not all the other people who got ripped off. And that's only to 1865. So part of what I want us to think about as we move into this conversation, the strategic conversation of what it means to go in and make change and create a new economy where we have different kind of relationships, it's like, what does that mean? What would Alton Sterling be doing in the new economy? You know, can't you just see Sandra Bland with her grandbaby on her lap? and you and her are drinking tea and laughing. That's the new economy, right? You're gonna have a different set of relationships. So I want you, before we get started, I read the intros, I just want you to just be present for a minute with that past and that present and that future because it's all here. Time is kind of a fiction, right? We're all embodying that all together and thinking about who and what do we have to be as we're listening? Different. And some the same, and some more of, and some less of, to make that happen. So can we just have that for a second? Thank you for that. So now we're going to have a conversation with the smart people. And there's all kinds of smart people in this room, so you know. It's so my job, and this is the part where I get to not be cute on live stream and put my glasses on. But I guess I could be, it's just like sexy librarian look. Right. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> so I'm going to um, read these introductions real quick, and then we're going to just Jump in, jump in, jump in. So let's see, we're gonna do it in the order of the, how folks are sitting, good, let's do that. Yeah, oh. Okay, hi, oh, you're the translator. Thank you, I appreciate you. Tell me your name. Can you okay. give her a hand? Because this is a <laughs> We love our interpreters, they're the bomb. They work so hard. So we have Erica Smiley with Jobs with Justice, yay! <laughs> as well as Highlander Research and Education Center. Um, Erica Smiley is the organizing director for Jobs with Justice. She sits on the board of the Highlander Research and Education Center. In the past, she's organized with community groups such as Progressive Maryland, the Tenant and Workers Support Committee, now Tenant and Workers United, and Virginia and SEIU Local 500. And she's originally from, she has to shout out her hometown, Greensboro, North Carolina. <laughs> Jacobo Ribeiro Rodriguez is, let's read the English version, sorry, um, works in the Department of Culture and Sports in the city of Madrid, Spain. He is an activist, author, and journalist who has published two books on Podemos and three books on ethics and sports. And then Kali Akuna, whose birthday is tomorrow, so you gotta give him an extra clap. You know, I had to mess with you. That was, I didn't, I had nothing, to see that was impromptu, right? Before you get mad at me. We'll do the Stevie Wonder version at the bar later. <laughs> Next, we, we got to keep it moving, y'all, because you know y'all going to have stuff to say and everything. Kali Okuno is with Cooperation Jackson, Malcolm X Grassroots Movement. He's a co-founder and co-director of Cooperation Jackson. He served as the director of special projects and external funding in the mayoral administration of, I hate to, I can't, it's hard for me to even say late, I'm sorry, Shokwe Lumumba of Jackson, Mississippi. Kali is also an educator and an organizer with MXGM. So give us, give them all another hand.
I loved how hype you guys are. So let's see, we have these mics. So the first question, we're gonna ask folks to briefly talk a little bit about the work you do, so everybody could have a little context, and then we'll start kicking it from there. It's okay, you can start, Ralph Smiley. Okay, great. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Great to be here in Buffalo today. It's a beautiful weekend. And uh, I really love the work of this network and, and others who are constantly challenging us to find new ways to build power for working people uh, to control their own lives. Um, and just a quick shout out to the Highlander Research and Education Center for really exposing me to a lot of this movement and this work. Uh, I love you guys. Um, so just really quickly to actually answer her question. <laughs> yes, for Highlander, let's give a round of applause. So, uh, so Jobs with Justice is a national network of permanent community labor coalitions uh, made up of unions, worker centers, community groups, neighborhood organizations, faith institutions, uh, youth and student groups, and the like, and that fight for um, our ability. Our, our vision really is of a world where um, everyone makes it, and that's anchored in our belief that all workers should have collective bargaining rights expanded to meet the needs of the 21st century economy we live in. Um, and just a, another quick shout out is the Buffalo Coalition for Economic Justice is our local affiliate here. Kirk's here in the room. They're fantastic. Members like Push Buffalo really make up our national network and make us tick. Um, so again, we really believe that if we were to build the kind of bargaining power we need in order to position this ailing economy on a path of providing the protections, the safety net, the quality of life we all deserve, then we need to refamiliarize ourselves with the direct action strategies that got us this far and expand the framework in which workers come together to collectively negotiate their conditions. So to us, the definition of collecting, collective bargaining must be expanded to meet the needs and the context of the modern day worker and the economy she functions in, regardless of what the law says. So I'll stop there, I have a lot more to say, but that should introduce Jobs with Justice. You can pass the mic. Uh, hi, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation in my name and in the name of the City of Madrid. It's a really pleasure to be here and to make the conversation with all of you. Uh, voy a hablar en español. <laughs> sí, I'm so sorry. Yo trabajo en el Ayuntamiento de Madrid. I work for the city government in Madrid. Es lo que se conoce como uno de los ayuntamientos del cambio que llevan un año en las principales ciudades de España. It's what is known as the city halls for change that have been in existence in Spain for about a year. Madrid es una ciudad de 3,5 millones de habitantes. Madrid is a city of 3.5 million um, inhabitants. Y muchos de los que ahora estamos en estos ayuntamientos del cambio, en Madrid, en Barcelona, en Zaragoza, en Coruña, Venimos de espacios políticos y sociales como el que está hoy aquí representado en esta sala. And many of us who are in this um, city hall for change or city governments for change in Madrid, Barcelona, Zaragoza, Zaragoza and others, are people like me that come from political spaces similar to the ones that you're in. Hemos hecho el camino entre ser activistas y ser ahora parte de las instituciones. We've made that journey from being activists to being part of the institutions. Pero realmente el camino no ha hecho más que empezar. But the journey has just started. Decía Macani que hay que darle la vuelta a la economía vieja. Macani said that we have to turn around the old economy. Nosotros queremos intentar darle la vuelta a todo. We want to turn everything around. A la atmósfera cultural de la ciudad, a las representaciones de las ciudades, de las personas que habitan las ciudades. The cultural atmosphere in the city and the representation by the citizenship. El poder en nuestro país vivía de espaldas a muchos de los ciudadanos que habitan las ciudades. The, the power in many of our parts of our country were be giving their backs to the citizens. Nosotros desde el Departamento de Cultura y Deportes del nuevo Ayuntamiento de Madrid. Us from the Department of Culture and Sports and in the, in the Madrid city government. Creemos que la cultura es un derecho humano. We believe that culture is a human right. Y que eso puede ser una palanca del cambio para otras situaciones. That can influence, that can be a leverage to change the situation. Y que el poder ha querido que la cultura fuera algo alejado de los ciudadanos. 
power wanted culture to be something that was far away from the citizens. Porque eso generaba desigualdad. Because that generated inequities. Y el gobierno en la ciudad donde yo estoy y en otras ciudades de España precisamente lo que quiere es acabar con la desigualdad. So and the government in the city that I'm in and other cities in Spain that's exactly what we want to end inequities. All right, now that wasn't um, public information, what McConaughey did. <laughs> so y'all act like y'all didn't hear that. <laughs> Otherwise, uh, I'm gonna have to exact some retribution on all of you <laughs> through some form of a practical joke. <laughs> um, so just keep that in mind. I got long memories and I do remember everybody's faces. So just keep that in mind. But again, my name is Kali Akuno. Uh, I live in uh, Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, and for the context of this conversation, I'm gonna do my best uh, to try to represent the, the totality of uh, the political project, the experiment uh, that I am a part of um, in Jackson, Mississippi. And not just the work of Cooperation Jackson, Cooperation Jackson is just one small kind of component within that larger process of transformation. Uh, it does not necessarily mean what I'm about to say, that all the different parts are as developed as each other, uh, or that they're as further along as we want them to be, but they're all kind of core elements of a strategy that we're trying to employ uh, to transform this municipality and then ultimately to transform Mississippi, United States, you, you can keep visiting from there. So. Uh, in our context, uh, over the past, I would say, almost 12 to 13 years now, there was a small uh, kind of work study group uh, within the Malcolm X grassroots movement uh, that worked on developing what is now called publicly the Jackson Cush Plan. And what I want to talk about is just one aspect of it, which is the Jackson Plan. And that piece kind of has three components of which, again, cooperation Jackson is just a minor component. Uh, the first component of it, which I think is really kind of the, the theoretical driving engine, is the People's Assembly. And that was designed to be uh, a vehicle of dual power, to contest for dual power, and to have a community level of authority and power to execute and to also uh, pressure corporations, the government, etc., to do things as we desire them to be done, in, in simple terms. The second aspect of that is building independent political power. And that is designed to both contest for and also to exercise um, state management. Oh, that quick, okay, state, state management. And I make a distinction between state management and state power, we can talk about that later. Because uh, that's not what we're doing at this point, that's a later aspiration that I think all of our movements need to aspire to in one form or another. That does not mean you have to believe in the state, but it does mean you have to deal with it and be clear about how you want to deal with it. And the last piece is building the social and solidarity economy, and that is the particular aspect that Cooperation Jackson is working on, and its aim is to build a strong local economy that takes care of the basic material needs of our community with the expectation and understanding that given the nature of the, the growing capitalist crisis, particularly as it reflects and plays out in the black community, that jobs are not going to be created fundamentally anymore by that system to take care of some of the basic social needs. So we have to start addressing that and take the means of production in our own hand, both as kind of taking it where it's possible to take, but also building it. And so that's some of the core context of the work that I'm doing. So thanks everybody for their giving us a little context. We're gonna go in and I just wanna remind folks that um, for those folks who are on Twitter, that if you are tweeting or making comments or asking questions, I'm actually monitoring them. Um, and I'm sorry that we don't have um, old school technology like postcards um, for that. And, and what we'll try to do is incorporate them, but we're not gonna be able to ask questions directly, but I will monitor. Com oh, we do have postcards. Ah! Now, but the postcards, let's be clear, the, postcard, <laughs> the postcards 
are, we're going to take pictures of them and post them so people can see each other's comments. We're not going to actually have time to read them. But they will be on the website forever. Okay. <laughs> so spell like you mean it. <laughs> so um, let's go in. And, and anyone can start this off. And we're going to act like we didn't tell you what these questions were in advance. So, so the, the first question I think everybody wants to know the answer to is what you think are the game changers? What do you think are the game changers? And then relatedly, what do you think um, that we need to be doing differently related, relatedly? Um, Jacobo, you want to go first? Why not? Well, for us it's very important to Sorry, uh, construir instituciones de representación. For us, it's very important to build institutions, representative institutions. Pero al mismo tiempo construir en las comunidades instituciones de participación. But at the same time, to build in the communities participatory institutions. Nosotros ahora estamos en una oportunidad única en España. Right now, we have a unique opportunity in Spain. Pero es importante que esta oportunidad sea acompañada por la sociedad, por los movimientos sociales, por las comunidades en los barrios. But it's important that with this opportunity that it's followed by the communities, by the yes. and the movements, social movements. Social movement. Porque estamos en el gobierno, pero no tenemos el poder. Because we are in government, but we don't have the power. El poder lo sigue teniendo el establishment. The power is still with, it, with the establishment. Y nosotros estamos luchando en, en una lucha desigual contra el establishment. And we are fighting in an unequal struggle with the establishment. Entonces necesitamos que la sociedad acompañe nuestra lucha. So we need society to accompany us in this struggle. Con, desde la independencia absoluta con, con los que ahora estamos en el gobierno. With that absolute independence of those of us that are in government now. Pero sabiendo que estamos viendo una oportunidad única. But knowing that we are living this unique opportunity. Nosotros estamos intentando recuperar algunas palabras que le habían robado a la gente. We are trying to even get back some words that were stolen from the people. La más importante democracia. The most important democracy. Porque nosotros creemos que la democracia es que la gente tenga salud gratuita. Because we believe that democracy means that people have free health care. Que tenga escuela gratuita. That they have free schools. Que se reconozcan las diferentes identidades sexuales. To recognize the different sexual identities. Que la gente se reconozca también en la lengua en la que habla. No solo en la lengua que domina sobre otras. To recognize people with the language that they speak, not the dominant language. Por ejemplo, en el Ayuntamiento de Madrid hemos hecho una campaña por la sanidad gratuita. So it, at the Spanish, the Madrid City Hall, we've done this campaign for free health care. En chino, en árabe, en wolof. In Chinese, in Arabic, in wolof. Porque nuestra ciudad está habitada por diferentes naciones y pueblos. Because our city is inhabited by different nations and people. Por ejemplo, en mi barrio viven personas de 80 naciones diferentes. For example, in my barrio, in my area of neighborhood. town, their neighborhood, there are people from 80 different nations. Y son tan madrileños como yo, son tan de Madrid como yo. And they are as much as from Madrid as I am. Pero si las instituciones de participación... <laughs> Pero si esta situación cambia en el gobierno... But if this situation changes in the government, nosotros seremos fuertes en las instituciones de participación. So we would still be strong in the institutions of participation. Porque el anterior gobierno se olvidó de nuestro barrio. Because the prior government forgot our neighborhood. De la gente que no hablaba español. The people that didn't speak Spanish. De la gente que no era blanca. The people that were not white. Porque ellos gobernaban, ellos entendían que democracia eran bancos, empresas. Because they understood that democracy were the banks, the, the businesses. Y la democracia es la gente. And democracy is the people. Y nosotros estamos tratando... And we are trying... Thank you very much. <laughs> con todas las dificultades, obstáculos, agresiones, con la mayoría de los medios de comunicación en contra... With all the difficulties, the barriers, the attacks, with most of the media against us. En, en construir esta atmósfera del cambio que los ciudadanos perciban todos los días. We are trying to build this atmosphere of change that can be perceived by the citizens every day. Y en eso estamos. And that's what we are doing. Esa es nuestra oportunidad. This is our opportunity.
Um, so starting, um, I guess, more meta, more big. Um, it's my fundamental belief that we have to turn the essential crisis of our age into opportunities. How do we change, how do we take the ecological crisis and make that an opportunity? How do we take the, the crisis of capitalism and make that an opportunity? How do we take the, the, the challenge, you know, the kind of the fragmentation, some of the breakdown that we see in the, the nation state system as an opportunity? The right sees these as opportunities um, and are seasoning them, and I think we have to up our game and also see them as opportunities in season. Now, there's a tremendous amount of, um, I think, fear and angst in this period, and rightfully so. Because if, if we don't kind of get our S together, we all know what's kind of lurking in the wings. And they have more resources than we do. They have more control over the, all the different means and institutions of, of, of sanctioned violence uh, throughout the globe than we do. But they're losing legitimacy rapidly. They're losing their own unity rapidly. Their own center and their own kind of consensus is, is fragmenting and breaking apart. I think we see that throughout the globe. I think we definitely see it here in, in this presidential election or selection, whatever you want to call it. Um, you know, it, it's, it's not just that for those people who kind of think that Trump is either a brilliant strategist or a fool, it's, he's there in part because of this crisis. Because the forces that he represents represent a small kind of insurgency on an element of the right, and they don't have their, their act together. They don't have a long-term vision or a long-term plan. So we now have the opportunity, I think, to seize the initiative if we get our act together and come with a vision and a plan, but it requires us, I think, to dig a little bit more deeper, find more points of unity and common ground, do some more deliberate coordination and planning with each other, which I think is hard, something that particularly here in the United States, I don't think we have that much real experience about to, to experience with, to be honest. And what do I mean by that? So for all of us who are like doing some form of solidarity economy work, say cooperative work, how much actual, either on a regional level or a local level, regional level, or a national level, are we doing direct exchanges, trading amongst each other? And let's be honest, we know it's not that much. But how are we going to scale up you know, the social and solidarity economy unless we start doing some more deliberate planning and integration amongst each other to get to that point? The only thing I think to a certain extent stopping us, to be honest, it is a question of resources. I'm not trying to downplay that. But I think there's also kind of an imagination gap. And with that, there's also a gap of the will. Right? Do we have the will to step up and do it? and figure out ways to do more of the solidarity aspect of it when the resources are not present and available, or we can't capture them, or somebody who has some money is not willing to be nice to us and give us some to, to use, how do we still make it happen? Like That is the ultimate thing that we still have to figure out with the limited resources that we have and, and, and put to execution and be very deliberate and strategic about it. So I see this time as kind of just distressing and troubling as it is, as a tremendous time. I'm glad I'm, I'm still alive to be here and to be present in the midst of all this confusion because it means that there's more opportunity now for us to actually change it because their institutions of control are weakening, right? And we have to see it in that way. If we don't see it in that way, then we just see the kind of the trouble, but we don't see the opportunity. So I, that's just kind of my, my challenge. It doesn't mean that, that I would sit here and present to you a lot of solutions. Uh, I am someone who sits, and most of my mental time is, is kind of focused on two things. A, how to ensure, you know, in this area of disposability for a large number of people, but particularly black people, how are we going to survive and come out the other end of this thriving and free? That's what part of my mind is, is, is kind of focused on. And the other part is kind of focused on how to make sure that my children and grandchildren 
live in a world that's actually better than the world I live in. And it has to be here in some productive fashion for that to happen. So I have a, we have a tremendous amount of responsibility to address the ecological crisis and this extension crisis that we're confronting right now. And we have more power than I think we give ourselves credit. We just don't have the, the political vision, the political unity, and I think in some part yet the political will uh, and the international relations, I think, to pull it off. But I think there's more desire to do it now than it existed in a long time. And I think that's what we need to, to see and look at. And like if you look at um, what's going on with what happened with Bernie Sanders, whatever your opinion of that is, whatever way you line up in that, and I think most people here are progressive people, that demonstrated that there's a hunger for progressive solutions more so than anything else. And it's up to us to figure out if we're going to let that opportunity slide just because he may stay in one camp or not another camp, or are we going to figure out some way to organize those people who responded to that call and put them in some active motion? So I think that's the challenge for us. I appreciate both of those comments uh, very much in both of those remarks. Um, you know, I was, I was asked to actually talk a little bit about strategy and uh, some of the strategies that we're experimenting with, some of the things that we're seeing that are exciting and are worth looking into and potentially learning from in order to actually build power. In, in our view, uh, Jobs for Justice, if we really want to build a new economy, we must directly confront corporate power, white supremacy, and all the systems of capitalism. We, we don't believe in simply setting up uh, separate systems as if to create kind of a paradise, a safe distance away from everybody else. And for us, collective bargaining at its best is a system by which workers are able to exercise power in a way that directly confronts the owners of capital and in a way that reclaims portions of that capital back to working people in our communities. It has served as a direct mechanism to fight for a fair return on the labor we put into building, operating, servicing, moving things. And so it is this dynamic that traditionally has been a, a historic source of tension between the movement for collective bargaining and the labor movement and the movement uh, that seeks to build a solidarity economy. But, but this is a false binary. And the cooperative movement and the movement to expand collective bargaining are not on opposite ends of the battle to build a society that works for everyone. We ultimately want the same thing for workers to have more power, more control over their labor power, more control over their working conditions and their communities. And we ultimately share in the desire for workers to benefit fairly from the fruits of their labor, from each according to their ability, to each according to its need. And in the process, to expand transparency and participation from all stakeholders most importantly, those operating the enterprise, the workers. But in order to make the real case for, for any of that, I want to just discuss a little bit the history of it, and then I have a couple of examples that I'll share. So, um, because I feel like we just have to have a, a clear background of our shared experience, and also where things have gone hideously awry in the US. We learn more from our mistakes than from our successes sometimes. Um, and then we'll come back to some of the examples. So, so first, I just want to make sure we're clear on the same page of even the idea of the corporation and how it's evolved in the United States, or I should say devolved in the United States over the past century. Uh, Stephen Perlstein wrote in the American Prospect, and quote, the earliest corporations, in fact, were generally chartered not for private but for public purposes, such as building canals or transit systems. Well into the 1960s, corporations were broadly viewed as owing something in return to the community that provided them with the special legal protections and the economic ecosystem in which they could grow and thrive." End quote. So the earliest corporations in the United States depended on stakeholders, which included workers and the surrounding community or the human capital first, first and foremost, over the idea of prioritizing the needs of shareholders. In fact, there is no historical or legal mandate that corporations must prioritize profits for shareholders, right, over the human and social needs of stakeholders. There's no, no uh, historical or legal mandate for that. But of course, globalization and deregulation incentivized the shareholder-centered approach, and companies spouting all that 
socialist jazz, were eaten up by the market. It is in this environment that unions in the US have relied on National Labor Relations Board elections to get, the bargaining, get to the bargaining table, even though that has never actually blazed the strongest path to negotiations. Even in the heyday of the National Labor Relations Act, government statistics in 1937 showed that while only 262,000 workers won union recognition through the electoral process sanctioned by that act, over 700,000 workers won union recognition by striking. Direct action always won more. So the big question of the past century, and the big question we still face today, is they're asking me to slow down. I'm going to try to speak as slow as I possibly can. I'm from North Carolina, right? Right. But I got seven minutes to fit all this in, so I'm going to do my best. So bear with me. So the big questions of the past century, right, and the big questions of today, the consequences of which we continue to negatively impact us, are who workers can bargain with and what workers can bargain over. So in other words, what are the boundaries of worker power and control over the companies they work for or control over our economy? Like, what are the actual boundaries of our power? Ideally, just like those of you in the cooperative movement seek to equalize ownership, control, and decisions over a company's model, practices, and distribution of revenue, union workers also sought to have a say over their business practices. And in fact, in the early days of some of the sharpest battles, in fact, in 1945, in the General Motors strike, some of you may remember this, at least the story, or reading about it, where uh, Walter Ruther and the uh, auto workers said that they wanted to raise, but without raising prices. That they wanted to be able to buy the cars that they created, and they wanted the community to be able to purchase the things that they were manufacturing. And uh, this was a very sharp moment. And Mitt Romney's father, of course, was a part of squashing it. Um, but the long and short is that this actually became the paradigm after World War II, that workers could only negotiate over this very narrow practice of, of wages and worksite things. Workers were no longer able to, through their unions, negotiate for broader community interests, interests beyond what was directly in front of them about wages. Uh, because the UAW ultimately accepted a contract that was just about wages, right? And this trend in bargaining persists today. So while many workers in other countries, like in Germany and South Africa and various countries in South America, um, have a role in governing a, com a company's business model and business practices, in addition to negotiating a fair wage, American unions have long been squeezed into this very narrow bargaining position. At the same time, historically, uh, workers reached another crossroad that negatively impacts us today, and for different reasons that I won't claim to have full expertise on. The collective bargaining agreements we were able to win, or the employment contract, as we call it today, started to include things that would have been better placed in a broad social contract for government programs accessible for everyone. Uh, these include health care, pensions, retirement security, you name it. And uh, it's been said that that actually has not only undermined our ability to win these big things uh, from the government for everyone to actually have, but has actually incentivized companies in the U.S. and corporations in the U.S. in fighting against unions more aggressively than they would in other places. So I share this because uh, I don't think all is lost. I share this because we need to understand the historic context of the fight for collective bargaining in the U.S. And I actually think that the position that we're in today, where companies are even fighting against that narrow uh, bargaining position, um, actually creates some huge opportunities for us. And I couldn't leave you today without sharing some examples of those opportunities, especially after uh, just the last couple of months where 45,000 Verizon workers were actually able to go on strike for over a month to win a contract, a first contract for some Verizon wireless workers. Yeah. So if anything, these setbacks have actually generated a more robust climate for organizing and experiment experimenting with a, a new paradigm for collective bargaining in the U.S. So first example, in Brooklyn, the Crown Heights Tenants Union is combining the efforts. It's Crown Heights, some, some people are part of the Crown Heights Tenants Union? That's awesome, I didn't even know. Follow back. All right, so, uh, so they're, they're combining efforts um, with some of the building staff of these large apartment buildings to actually confront the owners of these large apartment buildings over conditions and uh, wages and, uh, and rents. And together, they'll be able to win some kind of agreement. I think for the workers, it would be some kind of collective bargaining agreement. For the tenants, it would be another kind of agreement. 
but both would be binding and both would be able to expand what's possible in that industry and could lead to a completely different level of participation and decision making and create a new paradigm for negotiating in the largest real estate industry in the country. The Restaurant Opportunity Center, or Rock United, which some of you may be familiar with, is, ex thank you, is exploring how to increase work organization and participation where they have members by engaging some of the under-publicized laws in states like California and Maine that require workers to vote on how tips are distributed. Each year, they have to vote on how tips are distributed, which is not, not often happening, and certainly the, the restaurant owners aren't sharing that, right? But this seemingly small approach will actually allow them to build membership of restaurant workers and slowly expand what workers are collectively making decisions on. They're starting small, they're starting where they're at, but if they're successful, it's something that could be replicable to scale in restaurants around the country and build worker power and worker participation in a very different way. Um, in 2012 contract negotiations, the Chicago Teachers Union went beyond wages for teachers and fought to improve education for over 400,000 students through increased funding, stronger curricula, support systems for parents, right? And the, they, the union bargained for what they called the common good, going beyond the traditional scope of workplace bargaining, but expanding it to broader community conditions. They didn't wait for the law to tell them they could or couldn't do it. They just did it. And they forced the question with Mayor Rahm Emanuel, went on strike, and won. And then lastly, you know, I, this question McConaughey brought up in her opening around the, this new economy versus the old economy. You know, we have to be careful with this because our opponents use new economy to undermine our ability to bargain and negotiate with them. To our opponents, the new economy is the gig economy, it's the Ubers, it's the Lyfts, it's the Airbnbs. It's these entities that actually undermine workers' ability to organize in hospitality and transportation and taxi driving and whatnot. But there are models that are beginning to combat this as well. I mean, in New York, of course, there are folks who are trying to actually organize uh, those workers as workers, not as independent contractors, to be able to negotiate and bargain directly with Uber. In Seattle, however, they say, okay, fine. You want to call them independent employers? You want to call them independent contractors? Well, let's create an entirely new set of laws that allow them to negotiate with the, the parent company with Uber collectively. They can be both owners of their cars and workers who can negotiate with the company. And those may seem contradictory overall, but at this point, we're in a climate where we have to actually try and experiment with anything to see whether it's on the municipal level, on the state level, or the federal level to change the paradigm in which workers are able to negotiate and bargain. So I, I have other examples. I can't give them all here because I, we have such limited time. But um, I do want to share just one of the, the best known examples that I think uh, folks here would be familiar with, which is the Mondragon Cooperative in Spain and in the Basque Country, which is a huge example of both uh, the relationship, an, an exciting uh, example of the relationship between workers and collective bargaining and cooperative worker ownership. And there are a lot of parallels within the structure between Mondragon's experience and what we're able to do uh, here with, within the union experience, even within the narrow collective bargaining paradigm we have in the U.S. For example, in Mondragon, you know, you have a general assembly, which consists of all worker owners, which is similar to a union convention. You have a social council, which is essentially a bargaining unit representing workers as, as a whole internally to the management council. Whereas in the U.S., this would be an adversarial relationship between managers and workers. Because in, the, in Mondragon, because the, the uh, need to maximize profits for the CEOs of the exec is, is not there because it's a worker ownership cooperative, right? That, that's actually more of an opportunity for them to then jointly tweak and improve the practices of the company overall, right? And so even though they started in this very small region of the Basque country in Spain, they grew international to be all over the world to employ 75,000 worker owners, right? They actually built a cooperative model to scale and a model where workers have power in negotiating the decisions of a business model, right? So um, I just want to share a little bit there. I mean, I, I'll stop there, but I just want to bring home the nugget that number one, our movements are not at odds. And two, it's very key in this particular moment, not just to say there are these big opportunities, there definitely are, but that all we have to do is start where we are, in the one restaurant where we're based, in the one neighborhood where we know people who are driving for Uber or for Lyft, in the one town in the one city, and then to build replicable models that we can build up to scale. That's how we're actually gonna change the bargaining paradigm in this country, and that's how we're gonna build worker power.
That was awesome. Right. So I want to give you just a few minutes. I want you to turn to your neighbor and just talk about what you heard and, 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 and if you have some ideas about what you think are game changers. Just go ahead and have a conversation for a second. We need to hear about it from you.
All right, I hate to break it up. But um, we're going we're gonna to come back for um, a few um, closing comments because I, I know that probably, um, well, not probably, definitely, there were some amazing things that were said in these few minutes where you guys got to talk to each other. And I hope that um, some of those insights, you might grab a postcard to share, to go up on the website or tweet it. I really am following the Twitter. I swear I am. In fact, um, we had a, a, a couple of um, interesting observations as we sort of transition into our sort of closing remarks. Can you believe it's almost time? I can't. I can't do it. I'm so sorry, but you can talk to Eli and he'll help you. So, <laughs> and you know I want to, because people who know me know I love interaction, so this is hard. But one of, the, one of the things that came up in the Twitter feed was this question of, of scale, right? And, um, and, and how you move from this with integrity, because we've been struggling as a movement with this, not only in terms of the mechanics, because again, sometimes we get caught up in this notion of new and economy as, as economy being about work only. And um, I remember when um, I was a fellow in Copenhagen in Denmark, it was so interesting because it was like in the 2000, and there was all these things about Denmark that I thought that we wanted, right? Look, right, high wage economy, a level of integration, high unionization, um, a certain level of gender equity. And um, people were taking it all apart because they didn't want to share it with colored folk. And so, um, and that for centuries, racism and patriarchy, right, have dashed our movement have have we've gotten so far and then we get so far and then and people um some people say well it's colored people for like bringing up the this irrelevant stuff right <laughs> which is not right because it just won't work because we're talking about new relationships and we're also talking about new not in a way where we're erasing legacy and history and knowledge and what's what's real what we're standing on being in in the in that moment and so, um, so we want to think about this question of, of scale. We, we won't be able to get in. That could be a panel all by itself, right? <laughs> and, um, and also think about this question of, like, tactically. Folks have been talking tactically. But then we think about even how racism and patriarchy has affected big sectors of worker organizing and how, in some ways, Jobs with Justice came about as a way to be an alternative model, a different kind of model, a more inclusive model, right? So as we close, <laughs> as we think and reflect on these things, right? Um, there's, you know, we have sort of, you get a choice <laughs> a, of one of two closing prompts, and if you're really bad and you can do it, do it in your two minutes, then do both of them. Um, the first prompt is, if you could make a wish that could be granted for our movement, what would that wish be? And the second prompt was, if there's something that you wish you never did, <laughs> that you hope nobody would ever do <laughs> to help us move forward, what would that be? You ready to go first, Smiley? <laughs> Um, well, thank you again for a wonderful panel, brilliant panelists, and McCon let's hear it for McConney really fast. <laughs> um, you know, there are so many things that uh, the movement has, has 
done that is undermined us that I shared earlier. So I'll focus more on the, the wish side. And this question of, of uh, getting to scale with integrity, I think, is interesting because there is no clean version of any of this at whatever scale. Movements are messy. You just kind of have to accept that and keep moving. Um, so I, I, I don't want to, I don't want to undermine the question or belittle it, but it, but I think that the key thing for us is that um, wherever we are, like the key that we're trying to, to, but the thing that we're trying to produce is how to build, um, you know, increase worker participation, how to increase worker voice and decision making, and how to build worker power, power to negotiate over our conditions and over the the models of the businesses and the economies we can run, and. Um, you know, whatever scale that's possible at where you are, whether that's uh, one small store or small company in your community, we should do it. We should take that opportunity. If we have the power and we build the power to take over a large company or a large multinational company like, uh, and, or build one like they did with Mondragon, I think we'd be hard pressed to find a union or any organization who would want to turn that down and if and when we build the power to take over the uh, instruments of production in an entire economy, by all means, we shouldn't hesitate because we're worried about our integrity at scale. We should just continue to fight and trust in workers and in working people to have integrity, to have, if they're involved in the decision making, if they're fully participating, we should trust in them to build the thing that's gonna benefit all of us. We should trust ourselves. Um, so again, we all want shared ownership and equitable participation from working people in the way business is done. And it only makes our movement stronger to be approaching this from every angle available to us. So that's my wish for us today. Okay. Um, I tried to explain in English because I only have two minutes, but. If nobody understands me, can say, hey, stop, please. <laughs> <laughs> it's enough. Uh, well, my wish is that um, all together uh, try to, to, to make something similar to a contamination in the positive sense. No? Because Erika spoke about Mondragon Cooperative. It's an amazing project in Spain where the workers are the owners. But for us, it's very important also the contamination uh, about other experience in every, everywhere in all the world. No? For example, here, there are people from El Salvador or from other projects, even here in the States. No? But uh, to come uh, close to this moment in Spain or inspiration, maybe it was the jazz music and come from the States or the culture of people from Africa or the people that come from Senegal to live in, with us and talking about the cooperatives, uh, small cooperatives, small projects, no? And, uh, well, we try to, to, to walk um, slowly, no? And to learn and listen all the time, no? What kind of experience are uh, interesting for us, no? And, well, the, in the end of the 20th century in Seattle, no? Many people uh, were there and say uh, think global, act local, no? And we are still in the same way, more or less, no? But we know much more than people uh, knew in the end of the 20th century. We are in the 21th century. In the 20, 21th century, we think that is the time to change for sure. It's just now that we must change the economical religion. It's time to build a new uh, situation in, in Mondragon, have a long experience, and we can try to learn about what's the matter there, but also, um, 30 seconds. <laughs> um, well, I'm so sorry, but uh, we are maybe too much positives, and, but we, we need you. If you tomorrow will go to Madrid, you can see in the city hall a big flag that say, refugees welcome in English because most of the refugees people that come to Europe speak English, no? And I say, all of you are welcome now in Spain and mm, all the people are welcome if they won't change the world because we need the, all the people that try to change the situation, the economical situation, the cultural situation, the sports culture situation, blah, 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 etc. etc, etc, etc. And thank you very much for the opportunity. <laughs> Uh, 
I'm sitting here trying to think what I can do justice to in two minutes. Um, I'm, I'm one of these kind of people. I like to imagine the worst constantly. Because um, I think it helps me to get prepared um, to deal with the various forces arrayed against me and not to be blind to them. Um, but I do fundamentally believe, you know, I guess it's just revolutionary optimism, I do fundamentally believe that humanity can and will defeat this beast that we created called capitalism. I do believe that. Uh, and I don't think it's gonna be one path to that defeat. Um, I think it's going to be many paths to, to getting, the, getting there. And I think we need to be open to experimentation, um, open to criticism uh, within that, um, you know, constructive, uh, with the intention of helping to improve, helping us all get better. Um, but I, you know, I, I do want us to go into this, this situation, I think, with some steel resolve. Um, and I've been having a, a struggle being here this entire like weekend because of what's transpired, you know, just this last several days. And someone who's lived and experienced state repression very close, intimately in the family, um, folks, you know, not basically in exile or in prison for political commitments that they made, knowing that, that that is about to happen to this next generation, to this current generation. And that what happened on Thursday has changed the equation to where the more that we mount resistance, the more we should expect intensified oppression on their part. But we got to have to resolve to not be intimidated by the drones that they're unleashing and you know, uh, the new experimentation that they're doing uh, with using machines to execute people, which just happened on our watch you know, uh, just this past couple of days. So not be blind to what's going on and to really start getting prepared. And I think the aspect around where the solidarity component of the social and solidarity economy, I think is gonna increasingly be more important in this next period of you know, how we hold some people, how do we show up for each other? Uh, how do we protect each other? I think that's gonna be real for a lot of people who are in this room, but more people who are outside of this room. And how do all of us who are in here who have various points of privilege, various access to privilege, how do we make sure that we show up in this next period to defend folks and then to turn that around and us to go on a strategic offensive against all these different forces that are arrayed against us. I think we really need to think about that and get prepared for it. Amazing, amazing, amazing. Thank you all. Y'all are so amazing. So glad to be up here with you. Um, a couple of quick things. One, we. Um, Smiley and I said we had to give a shout out to Adam Greenberg's mama, who um, people were like, why? <laughs> because um, one of the things he tweeted was that his mom was, was part of w about to win um, rights for Boston ESL teachers as an example. That's another case study, so we wanted to shout out Adam Greenberg's mama. Yeah, <laughs> do that. And then just as we close, as we close, um, in addition to thanking our awesome panel, I want to thank all of you because as everyone said in one form or another, all, we are the sum of each other. Our work, we learn, we build. And um, as Janet Jackson says, we can't be stopped. Thank y'all. <laughs> Let's give it up for the closing plenary one more time.
Okay, some announcements and then the formal close. Um, so first, I'm going to start off with a few announcements. Sure. Um, the last shuttle to downtown Canisius is leaving at 5.15. Um, so for those of you who need to go back either to your hotel or to your dorm if you stayed there, 5.15 is the last chance to get a, catch a shuttle. Um, when you leave today, um, outside in the hall is going to be your last call to get posters, t-shirts, and other merchandise that's been um, for sale throughout the weekend. Um, if, you, if you don't turn your room key in, you'll be charged a lost key fee. Uh, so if you want to drop your key with us, you can give it to Darcy, who's going to be outside the merch table when you leave, um, or you can go back to your dorm. Actually, that would be better if you can go back to your dorm and give it to them there. Um, finally, we're going to send everybody an evaluation over email, so please fill it out. Um, hearing from you all is going to help us figure out how to do this better in the future. So please be on the lookout for that evaluation. Do it next year. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Sachi. I support. <laughs> Um, I think that I, I got lucky. I, I get to um, uh, have us all show some serious love and gratitude for all the people um, who made this weekend possible. So um, I'm going to run through an, an incredible list of people. Please hold your applause until the end um, so we can uh, celebrate everyone at the same time. Um, but first off, can I have all the NEC staff and interns please join us on stage? So um, this incredible crew of people has been working close to like 20 hours a day the last week to pull this off. Um, we're, we don't have time to thank everyone individually, but um, I especially want to recognize Ash and Tori, if you can just step forward. <laughs> Ash and Tori have made Common Bound their whole world life for the past few months and um, I just really can't even do justice to how much time and love and energy they've put in. I also want to recognize especially our interns, many of whom came on within the past few weeks. I don't know if they knew what they were getting into, but they found out quickly. Um, and so if interns could just like raise your hand, we're really, really... I also want to thank many of our um, family, friends, and loved ones who are over here who have supported all of us to put in those hours. Um, I know that meant that they picked up a lot of the things that we couldn't hold. And I'm going to actually have to ask you to hold your applause again <laughs> until the end, all right? Um, I also want to recognize the NEC board who consistently shares their wisdom and builds our confidence in the work that we're doing, and many of whom have been here all weekend. And so I just really want to thank them for their support. Oh my God, all the volunteers, please raise your hand if you took on a volunteer shift this weekend doing just totally invisible work, and we really, really appreciate it. <laughs> all right, let's go let's go <laughs> Y'all are, are not following the directions about holding your applause. Um, next set of thank yous, these are for the, the city of Buffalo. So we want to first give the whole city uh, a big thank you for hosting us and allowing us to do this here. Um, especially as a, as a subset of that, uh, the city of Buffalo, we want to give a big shout out and thank you to the Crossroad Collective, um, which is our host committee. They spoke to us. Um, in the plenary space throughout the weekend and also hosted a number of workshops and we really, um, it wouldn't have been right to do it here without them and they were a huge asset for us. 
Um, we want to thank uh, Buff State University, where we are today, uh, the University of Buffalo and Canisius College, um, where we all stayed over the course of the weekend. Uh, we want to thank our many different catering teams. Tori could probably run down all the different. Uh, I want to thank Cartwell. I want to thank Lloyd. I want to thank Westside Bazaar. Um, and I want to thank uh, Buffalo and Springs Festival for all the extraordinary. They were next. They were next on my list. <laughs> You can, you can give it up for Buffalo Infringement Festival, who, provor, who provided all the arts and culture and performance throughout the, throughout the weekend. Um, we want to thank those who helped share the incredible stories and images from the weekend. Um, extra environmentalists who did our live stream and recorded a number of sessions. So if you didn't get a chance to see all the sessions you wanted to, which I assume is all of us, um, please check out the recorded sessions from the live stream. Um, also, our photographer, Dimitri, has already been putting um, beautiful photographs online. The Laura Flanders Show has been doing interviews, and Truth Out has been doing syndication. Um, so the next set of people I'm going to ask uh, to, to stand up or raise your hand or in some way be recognized we organized this conference in a very uh, different way than we've done in the past. Um, and we worked with a group of over 90 volunteer coordinators to help pull, pull it together. Um, so could all of the, I know a lot of people have dispersed already, but the, work, the track coordinators and network gathering coordinators, if you could stand up or raise your hand or identify yourselves. And we can, uh, we can break that rule. We can give it up for them. They deserve it. Um, I also want to thank our amazing uh, plenary speakers and moderators. Uh, we had some really, really great content on this stage um, and really helped, I think, create a great arc for the, for the conference itself. Um, connected to that, we want to thank uh, St uh, Center for Story-Based Strategy, especially Christine and Bernice, um, for helping us pull this together and act as our MCs. Um, we want to thank our workshop presenters. I know a lot of you presented workshops over the course of the weekend, but that was really the, the meat of the conference and um, was really, really critical for what we, what we wanted to do here. Um, and finally, we want to thank all of our, um, the, we want to thank the Access Interpreters Co-op um, who are providing translation uh, and interpretation throughout the weekend. Jamie, can you come over here? <laughs> so we raised um, over $180,000 to support this conference through individual and contributions and contributions from um, foundations and other organizations. Um, we received generous grants from the Chorus Foundation, the Fund for Democratic Communities, the Germishausen Foundation, the John R. O. Shai Foundation, the Mary Reynolds Babcock Foundation, the Paul and Edith Babson Foundation, the New England Grass and the New England Grassroots Environmental Environment Fund. Our sponsors were Cloud Mountain Foundation, Gardner Supply Company, M&T Bank, Dr. Bronner's, Equal Exchange, again, Fund for Democratic Communities, Triad Distributing Co., Boston Impact Initiative, Corporate Accountability International, Dollars and Cents, National Cooperative Bank, Trillium Asset Management, Beanfield Snacks, Capital Institute, Cooperative Development Institute, Cooper Cooperative Fund of New England, Resurgence Brewing Co., RSF Social Finance, The Working World, and The Laura Flanders Show. So many, many organizations and foundations helped to make this possible. We also had an outpouring of generous support for our scholarship fund, um, and we received over $10,000 from individuals. And um, these individuals made it possible for Common Bound to be as accessible and as representative of our powerful movement as possible. Um, we couldn't have done this conference without all these supporters, so thank you to all of you. Thank you. 
And I think finally, I just want to say give it up for yourselves. Um, you, you helped make it a really amazing weekend. Thank you very much for joining us here. Yeah. Okay, friends. So, there has been a call to expanding our imaginations. There has been a call to go out there and do this. As on the first night, I said happy common bounding for this weekend, but the common bounding goes on beyond this, right? And there is a call, and um, when Connie was doing it, a wish and a flag. So when this old economy forces us into silos, we will think in systems. When this old economy says be mechanistic, we will be relational. When it says be alone and isolated, we will know that we are together and connected. When that moment comes that you're fearing and you want to stay small, the call right now is to risk and be bigger and together. When it call is to say we are scarce and we do not have enough, we know that they are wrong and we know they're abundant and we always have more of who we are and our soul and our love. So go out and common bound, and this is about making this web bigger. So I challenge you all that everybody between now and the next that you will weave at least another 10 people into this web in order to build the world that we need. Are you ready? Yeah. Let's do it. Thank you all, and let's go.